I would say that you matter. All of the things that you thought was just a you problem isn't. Everybody else is experiencing these things. And most of the time they're experiencing it in silence. So continue to move forward and continue to use your voice to get the word out. Because you wouldn't believe, John. Like you really wouldn't believe how many people are in the back of the pack and like the look of defeat that happens on their face when they see the volunteers slip over the water table. And you'd be like, so there's no more water on the course? <laughs> like, no, there's no more water on the course. It's like, damn. Welcome to For the Long Run, the podcast exploring the why behind what keeps runners running long, strong, and motivated. I'm your host, Jonathan Levitt. Through personal and professional connections in the running world, I have the privilege of getting to know some amazing athletes. I've always been fascinated by the psychological aspects of running and what helps people to achieve success, however they define it. And this podcast is aimed at exploring this and much more. I hope you enjoy. We are proud to share that this episode is sponsored by our friends over at Puma. Here at For the Long Run Podcast, we're fans of Puma and have been really impressed with their efforts to support and foster the running community. We're excited to partner with a brand that has such a rich history in sports and that cares deeply about the running community. Puma believes that sometimes all it takes is a spark to make a change, to get motivated, or to try something new or hard. And we couldn't agree more. All we need is that small spark and the actions will follow to get us there. With that small flicker, anything is possible. Puma Running Shoes offers supreme cushioning, superior propulsion, comfort, and lightweight technology. I've been running in the DV8 Nitro first mile, and I love how it has a focus on sustainability. The shoe feels amazing, and even better, it's in collaboration with First Mile. It's made from at least 20% recycled material, as First Mile's focus is on cutting down plastic waste in production and in the supply chain by finding innovative ways to get recycled plastic into products like Puma Running Shoes. Check out a pair for yourself at puma.com and use the code for the long run for 20% off any Puma Run or Train products. When you support Puma, you support me and the rest of the For the Long Run podcast team. Thanks again to Puma for sponsoring us. Thanks again to Gooder for supporting this episode. I have more than a few different styles at this point, and I love them all. At $25 a pop, you can leave a pair in your car, your backpack, or really anywhere so that you'll never be without some shades. You can feel good about your purchase too, as 1% of Gooder's annual gross sales, that's not just profits, Go directly to environmental nonprofits working towards making our world a better place. If you'd like to support me in the show, treat yourself to a pair or two or three of Gooders and head over to Gooder.com and get free shipping with the code FTLR. Your face will thank you. We are proud to announce the newest sponsor of the podcast, Scratch Labs. Scratch Labs is a local Boulder-based sports nutrition brand known not just for their awesome sports nutrition products, but for their love of science and the community. I'll share a bit more about their products and how I use them. But for now, thank you to Scratch for supporting the podcast. Scratch will be a partner of the podcast this summer. And as always, supporting the brands that support the podcast helps to keep this machine rolling. You can use the code FTLR20 for 20% off all Scratch products through their website via the link in the show notes. And welcome back. I have Martinez Evans joining me on the podcast today. Martinez, thanks so much for taking some time to chat. John, thank you for having me, man. Of course. We were just uh, we were just saying that we go way back. I think we first connected more than 10 years ago. Um, so it's been really cool to see what you've been up to over the last many years. And, and I'm excited to hear a little bit more detail about it. Thank you, man. So the first question is always a tough one. Who is Martinez? Oh man, that is a tough one. (laughs) Martinez is an advocate. He's a fat runner. He's an author. He's uh, a fearless leader of a community of over 10,000 members worldwide. He's an eight-time marathoner. He's a fur dad. He's a husband. He's a son. Um, He's a brother. He's an uncle. He's all of these things. And you're always smiling. What's that about? (laughs) Man, when you <laughs> when you have the life that I have, man, once you make it, all you can do is smile. <laughs> what does that mean? I love the I love the the joy in your voice with that. Um, this podcast is all about. Um, I'm I'm less interested in tangible achievements and oh, I ran this time and I finished this many marathons, and more about 
you know, how, how you get there. And I've had gold medalists sitting on this couch behind me and uh, in the Olympics. And I, I said to them, okay, but what happened next? And like, this is the stuff that I find so fascinating. This is the stuff that I think people can learn from. So maybe you said that in jest, maybe not, but talk to me about what, what it means when you say you feel like you've, you've made it or you made it through. Uh, well, John, just to even talk about, so I grew up on the east side of Detroit, Michigan, right? Um, very rough spot. Um, before the age of 10, I had two brothers die. So I had a brother who was in the drug game and got killed doing whatever drug dealers do. And then I had a brother who died by suicide uh, when I was um, nine and a half, ten. 10. So growing up in that environment, living next to a crack house growing up, I, I, I do smile a lot because I know what, I, what I've been through and I know what I made it through. So if I can make it through that, everything else is, you know, gum drops and berries, man. And how did you find running? Um, I found running in 2012. And so believe it or not, I was selling suits, man. I was a suit salesman at Men's Warehouse. Uh, wore a suit every day for a better men of two years. Wore higher bottom shoes and was on my feet eight to 10 hours a day. And by being on my feet eight to 10 hours a day, I started to develop like some hip issues, man. Like hard bottom shoes is not the type of shoes you want to wear for eight to 10 hours a day. So I developed some hip issues. I went to go see a doctor. Um, never met that doctor. It was the first time me meeting that doctor. And he was like, Mr. Evans, I know why you're in pain. Okay. Like, why is that? And his answer was, because you're fat. So you got two options, lose weight or die. And I was just taken aback. For one, I was on my feet eight to 10 hours a day <laughs> selling suits. Like if you ever been in commission sales, you know how much like you're on your feet, you're walking around, you're doing all this other stuff, right? So for him to be like, you're fat, lose weight or die. And then he goes on this whole thing of like, you know, you got a stomach of a pregnant woman and all these other things. Um, this is a doctor? Yes, this is a doctor. <laughs> got it. Okay, just clarifying. <laughs> a, a, a doctor. Um and so I remember saying to him, because he's like, you know, you should start walking, like, you know, walk one time around the track. And then if you get tired, don't worry, it's OK. Go back the next day and walk two times around the track. And like, I was fed up. So I said, screw you, screw this. And I'm going to run a marathon. And he laughs at me. And he tells me that's the most stupidest thing he heard in all of his years of practicing medicine. He told me, if you run a marathon, you will die on that course. So he told so, you, he told you, lose weight or die, but don't run a marathon. Exactly. What is this, like Dr. Pepper, Dr. Who? Like, <laughs> what, what qualifications does this guy have? So we, we continue to have an argument. I stormed out the doctor's office and I bought running shoes that day. And so as I was going home, I drove past a fleet feet. I went in there and told them I need running shoes today. And from that point on, I got on the treadmill and failed miserably. Like, I couldn't run longer than 15 seconds. Um, it had a mixture of, of, of a bunch of things, right? So I was inconveniently sandwiched between uh, two gazelles. So, like, one guy was going, like, 10 on the treadmill. <laughs> the other guy was going, like, 9. This is the first time I've been on the treadmill in years. I'm thinking to myself, well, they're going 9 and 10. I can at least go 7. Next thing you know, 15 seconds later, I was on the ground, man. But you got up. I got up. Why? Because <laughs> mama ain't there. He's no punk. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got up. I got the hell up out of there. Um, and for a second, like, for a hot second, I was beating myself up to say, like, this doctor, maybe he is right. Maybe I'm, I am stupid. And I reached out to the doorknob of my apartment, and I have this tattoo on my right wrist. So, like, I reached out to grab this doorknob and like my sleeve rolled up just a little bit. And I have this tattoo on my, on my right wrist that says no struggle, no progress. And it's a reference from the, the famous 1857 speech from Frederick Douglass of the same thing. And I remember like looking at that, that tattoo and like parts of that speech rang in my ears and I knew what I had to do. So, like, for those of you who don't know, it's like, you know, if there's no struggle, there's no progress. Like, those who favor freedom uh, but deprecate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the land. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without this roar. Like, 
there must be a struggle in order to get progress. And that stuck with me. And seeing that tattoo, going through what I was going through, I was like, you know what? I know what I got to do. I got to go through the struggle. That phrase is like the epitome of why I think a lot of people run. I've become good friends with Hayden Hawks out here in in Boulder. And Hayden is uh, a very, very strong and incredible trail runner with aspirations to win Western States and all these big races. And he's like, man, I do this because I can and because we we live through hard moments, whether it's in life or in, like optional things like putting yourself out there on a run. Mm-hmm. And it's so fascinating to hear how it's um, the, like the, 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 how you're putting it, right? It's like, if you, if you went out and ran that marathon and had no struggle whatsoever, do you think you would have done a second, third, fourth, eighth? Probably not. Right. It's, it's, I've run eight marathons as well. I think I don't really know what the number is, but I've had w- one really good one, one decent one. And the rest were really hard. And mm-hmm. I've learned, I learned more from the, the 75% that didn't go well than the two that did. And I think there's beauty in that. And I think there's strength in, I don't want to say suffering, but like you work towards something and it's not guaranteed to, to go well. But okay, so I want to go back to that time, uh, 2012. Um, so you run the lap on a track, you run two laps on the track, you get on the treadmill, you fall down, you get back up. It's it's easy to you know give something a week's worth of effort or two weeks worth of effort. But what I always tell people about getting started with running is like, it's going to really suck for like three to five weeks. And at some point it might stop <laughs> sucking. It, it might not, um, but you might just get you know, you might just continue to improve. At what point were you like, okay, I think I'm on to something here and I'm actually starting to enjoy it. The, the first time I was able to run five minutes straight, hands down. Because literally going from 15 seconds and continuously to build over day after day after day. I remember the fact of being like, holy crap, I can run for five minutes straight. And not be tired. That was the time I knew. Like, okay, I know I can do this. Okay, so your your baseline is now five minutes. Yes. At what point did you actually sign up for the marathon? So I didn't sign up for the marathon until I met the doctor in June 2012. I didn't sign up for that marathon until January 2013. So during that time, you know, I started cost to 5K. And then I found out like, oh, there's a local 5K. I do that 5K. They gave me a medal. I was like, dope. I didn't expect to have a medal. And then a friend told me like, oh yeah, like most races have a medal. And then I'm like, okay, well, like let me see what's in the area. Like let me see what medals they got. And then went from couch to 5K, did that. Like I said, ran my first 5K. Then started training for a 10K. And same thing. I did a bunch of 10Ks enjoyed some medals. And then my friend was like, oh, like there's a, a local half marathon. Like Runner's World calls this like one of the beautiful uh, half marathons in the area. Like you should do it. Okay. Sign up for that. Being the hottest day of the year. Of course. Did that. It sucked. So hot. John, it was so hot that they had to call in the fire department to spray us down. <laughs> So, like, imagine it's so hot that they call the fire department with the fire trucks. And every half burning, a mile or burning so. Burning up the roads. Man, they would spray us down. So, did that and did the half. And I was like, all right, like, this is cool. And from that point on, I was toying around with 5Ks, 10Ks, half marathons, right? And when the new year came, I was like, all right, like, what marathon am I going to run? Like I said, I'm going to run this marathon, but I didn't know which one I was going to run. And I think I got like an ad on Instagram or Facebook from Detroit Marathon as like, you know, registrations for the Detroit Marathon open up on New Year's Day because they always open up their um, registration on New Year's Day. And I was like, okay, this is what I was going to do. It made sense. I was, Detroit is my hometown, so all of my family is there. 
and I signed up back January. So you're standing on the start line of the Detroit Marathon. What are you what are you thinking? I'm scared shitless, man. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things to add is that I did training by myself. Like I trained myself. Like no coach I, I couldn't find a coach that would train a 300 pound man. So like I bought a bunch of running books and I just like hodgepodge a, a training program together. And one of the things that really stood out to me was like, so I'm supposed to run 26.2 miles without having ran 26.2 miles ever. So that was the thing that was going through my head. Like my longest run was maybe a 20 miler or a 21 miler. And I'm thinking to myself, like, what happens after mile 21? You hit the wall, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> So, like, that was the thing I was most nervous about was I've never ran past 21 miles. I don't know if I can ever do this. Now you've done it eight times. Yeah. What's that like? Um, I still get emotional every time I cross the finish line, man. It's it's one of those things where running a marathon is an emotional roller coaster. Like, you go through some happy parts. You go through some sad parts. You go through some parts where it's like, yo, this sucks. I want to quit. And then you cross that finish line and it's like, dang, all of this is over again. So I get emotional, man. I want to hear more about your experience as a 300-pound runner. I had India Cook on the podcast uh, talking about her New York City Marathon experience and chasing a seven hour, sub-seven-hour marathon. I've had a lot of the front of the pack on this podcast and a lot of requests for back of the pack, middle of the pack um, mm -hmm. runners. And in doing so, I find the journey super fascinating or that story super fascinating because I had never considered that the course might shut down. Mm -hmm. And like I was watching Boston this year from mile 24 and like people were running on the sidewalk at 6 p.m. because the roads were open again. Like I can't imagine the mental strength it takes to keep going when basically the city and the race has said, we're done, everyone's finished, but people continue to push on. And so what's your experience in that arena, knowing that sometimes that's that's in the cards? John, um, at this point, you just realize that no one's going to save you. So you have to do whatever you need to do to make it to the finish line. That's something I always tell all the people that I coach. Nobody's going to save you. If you think like they're going to be ha proud or clapping for you when you after the course limit, no. They're going to be shutting things down. And I think like that's something that um, I experienced myself. John, like I've ran races where they ran out of water. I ran races where they ran out of cups. I ran races where they ran out of medals. I ran races where they've taken down the signs. I've ran races where they've pulled up the timing mat. So now my friends and family can't can't track me on the app anymore. Like I've ran races where all of that stuff has happened. And it's a, it's a shitty experience to go through. And I think, you know, being the person I am, like being able to a fight for that and fight for equality, like whatever that means. You know, a lot of races are like, oh, like we want diversity and we want all this other stuff. But my thing is, you're you're forgetting one thing: pace diversity, right? <laughs> like supporting the people in the back who've paid their money as well to sign up for this race, who did the training as well to sign up for this race. And the only thing that's different is that they just move slower. So, you know, I, I think for myself, it, it's one of those disheartening things where you get race directors that are, that are like, oh, I'm old school. So, like, when this is done, this is done. And my my saying to them is that, okay, like, we're going to see if your race is around in 10, 15 years when Gen Z is around and they're going to be like, yo, this is unfair. And, like, we're not going to participate in your race. Yeah. So, like, I, I think that's the thing, right, is that 
we've all seen like outside of the field, like outside of, you know, the top 1%, the elite athletes. Overall, marathon times are going down. They're slowing down. I, I guess that's a better way to put it, right? So if we all know they're slowing down, why aren't races accommodating for that? You know, why are they still using the same excuse of like, oh, well, we got to work with um, municipalities and all these other groups to make this happen? And then my question is, well, what's an extra hour? Like, what's an extra hour? Or like, get creative. You know, after, my thing is this, after the elite runners, nobody else matters because everybody else is signed up for a participation medal. My thing is, if you're not running to, you know, to keep your elite status and podium and, you know, get for the race money and stuff like that, you don't matter. You're just there for a participation medal. <laughs> so if that's the case, like, why we're still doing it, you know, ways of like having the faster people go out first. Like, my thing is like, can we get creative? Like, are there ways where we can do where they doing some of the trail stuff where you do Don Patrol, where you can sign up and say, well, um, I don't think I'm gonna make it in the course limit. So like, why they just can't lead a mass out and let people like self-select to start early? Like why they can't divert the course a little bit for so that the elites are, so they can get the elites out the way and then the slower people can participate. And then everybody finishes at once. I think there's a lot that can be learned from trail running in particular. I think trail running enables a bit of a different experience in that it's not on public streets and, you know, whatnot. Um, but you see the, you know, there's a race here in Colorado, Run Rabbit, and um, the normal people run first. And then the mm. pros, they call them the rabbits and the tortoises. And the the faster group goes at noon, I believe. And the, the other group goes at 8 a.m. or whatever it is. Mm. And so they have a four-hour head start. It's a 100-mile race. So, you know, four mm. hours is really not, not all that much time in the grand scheme of, of that race when it's taking, you know, 30-plus hours for a lot of people. But um, maybe that's an option. Who knows? I, I, don't, I don't think the goal is to solve the problem on this podcast, but rather just um, no. talk about it. <laughs> Um, Look, that's something I'm very passionate about. <laughs> yeah, no, and and there certainly has to be, you know, a different way to go about it. And and the current ethos of, well, this is how it's been. Um, we're seeing it's being struck down in you know every arena because it should be struck down in every arena. Like change is a good thing. Um, right. But you make an interesting point about like diversity is being celebrated in every way besides pace. Um, I do want to talk about the aspect of being a black runner in 2023, um, understanding how we get more people who don't look like me out there running races. And um, one of the things I like about this podcast and this platform is the ability to have a, a different group of people represented. And, and the thing that connects us all is everybody just wants to feel like they belong. And mm -hmm. so you've done that with your, with your running club. You've done that with your book, which we'll talk about. Um, but talk to me about the, the representation aspect and, and how you feel it's important to be on the start line so that other people see you on the start line and, and whatnot. I don't want to put words into your mouth, but curious where you're at with that. Yeah, man. I, I, I think I, I am at this intersectionality of like being uh, a cis hat fat black man. Right. So I think like there's, a lot of intersections. So yes, I'm a black man. Yes, I'm a straight black man, but also I'm a fat black man. And I think all of those um, have some intersectionality around that, right? Most racers are like, yes, like we want diversity. And it is around like black and white or or like trying to do people who fit into like the non-binary spectrum and like figuring that stuff out, right? And I think that most of the times, yes, being a part of this and providing places where individuals of color or any individual of color or, or just in general so that they can feel comfortable running, right? And providing that education. So for example, like me growing up in Detroit, Michigan, um, you won't see me running unless like there's something going on, right? But like, it's also one of those things where it's 
systematic. Our parks are closed down. Our sidewalks are crap, you know, things of that sort. But also when you move out to other neighborhoods as a black man, there's still issues that need to be happening. So I remember, uh, for example, running, um, I, was, I went to grad school at UConn. So I remember it being late at night, not even late at night, but like, let's say 9 p.m. and just running on campus. And then like the police ride past me and then do the U-turn and then comes back around me, follows me and then turn the lights on to question me. Like, you all right? Why are you running? Where are you running from? And me being in bright ass running clothes and being like, I'm just going for a run. (laughs) So like that stuff doesn't make you want to participate in the sport or in general when you you have that happen, right? Um, I think the other thing, uh, you know, Boston Marathon is something that just recently happened. I was at the Pioneers tent, right? Like I wasn't there when um, like the police came and lined up, but I was there like the initial parts of it where, you know, police was just over, just, just I don't know, over policing for, for lack of better words. I talk with a lot of people that were, that were at that tier station, white people, black people, et cetera, all sorts of people. And everyone that was there tells the same story that there was a lot of energy. There was a lot of hype. People are on the course and that's the part that's not okay. But the the point that I want to make is that I've been within a mile of there and done the exact same thing and didn't have that response. And it was, it, it was, that's the part that we need to highlight that yeah. like the response is not the same and that's not okay. The, and I think that's the thing, right? Is that the response of, I put it like this. If, if you all, and you know, I don't want to go deep into it, but like, if you are tracking friends on your tracker and you want to celebrate them, reach out, give them a high five or whatever, cheer them on, and then you get back on the sidelines. Everybody does that. I have not been to one race, and I've been to a lot of races where if you don't see, if you see your friend, you're just going to sit on the sideline and do a golf clap. Right. Yeah. You're going to get loud. Good job, John. <laughs> Keep going. You got this, buddy. No. Like you're going to celebrate your friend. You're going to get them hype. So I, I think like just the response of that, um, you know, but I think like those things of being a, a black athlete or a black person in the space where it's like, we can't even do the same thing that other people are doing, be it right or wrong without the response that it garners. What keeps you doing it? I don't know, spite, pissing people off. Um, but that only goes so far, right? <laughs> you, you're still uh, doing it. You're still going to keep doing it, even if people tell you or society is pushing back. I think for me, it's, it's more of a larger mission um, these days. Um, yeah, I say spite piece, people pissing off, but like I've taken on this mission of getting one million people to start running. And what I got from that is that, yeah, this, 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 Running is amazing. There are some shitty things in running. There's some things in running that needs to change. But I still enjoy all of the things I get from it. Even the further races that I didn't receive a medal or I had to um, make it a scavenger hunt to find to the finish line or like all these other things, right? Like I still enjoy running and I still enjoy the process of um being in the mindset of like, all right, I'm going to do the best I can do and show up my best self right then and there. Um, I really enjoy that, right? And I think running is the only sport where um, you can participate on the same course as the professional athletes and are around the same time they participated. Like, it ain't like you can go on a basketball court and like go play pickup basketball on like another um, rim while Le- Le- while LeBron is out there. It ain't like you can go and like kick around the soccer ball while Ronaldo is on the on the on the court, right? But running is the only sport that I know of that uh, you can run almost immediately after Des Linden being on the course, Elliot being on the course, right? And I think it's something about that that. Um, that just gives me a sense of pride to know that I'm out here 
And when it's all said and done, we, we are all running the same distance. Did you know we're on YouTube? We're posting quick clips of the top takeaways from each episode. Now through June 19th, subscribe to our channel to enter to win a year's worth of Puma shoes. All subscribers are entered to win automatically. Head to youtube.com slash at for the long run podcast and subscribe. Yes, you do need to include the at symbol. This episode of For the Long Run podcast is sponsored by Puma. For 75 years, Puma has been pushing sports and culture forward with innovative design and development. We are honored to have Puma supporting this show and supporting the running community at large. My greatest compliment for running shoe is, I didn't think about it once. The purpose of having the right gear is to enable you to do anything you want out there. When I'm running in Puma's DV8 Nitro first mile, all I'm thinking about is literally anything else. I think about the community, I think about why trying hard things is so rewarding, I think about how cute Alfie is, and I think about how much I love tacos, and I think about the big things like how I want to leave each place I inhabit better than I found it. You know what I'm not thinking about? What's on my feet. And that's the best thing about Puma running shoes. They're designed to help you get out there effortlessly so you don't have to worry about what's on your feet. Just need to worry about putting one foot in front of the other. Check out a pair for yourself at puma.com and use the code for the long run, all one word, for 20% off. Again, when you support Puma, you're supporting me and the rest of the podcast team. Thanks again to Puma for supporting us. We are proud to be sponsored by a local Boulder-based sports nutrition company that we all know and love, Scratch Labs. As you may know, last year I went to their facility here in Boulder and got a sweat test done. They were able to tell me how much salt I'm losing during a workout and recommend sports nutrition from there. Long story short, I'm a salty sweater and need to replenish perhaps more than the average person. But that's not all. About a year ago, I started working with sports dietitian Kylie Van Horn. Kylie is the owner of Fly Nutrition and a coach within Microcosm. I was having a lot of GI issues pre-run and during the run, so David, my coach, suggested I work on nutrition with Kylie. I switched my nutrition pre-run to purely liquid fueling, and while that didn't solve 100% of what I'd been dealing with, it sure has helped. Fast forward a year and more, and Scratch's products have helped kept me fueled and energized through plenty of strong workouts and long runs, as well as some big adventure days in the mountains. Their super high carb mix is exactly that. It's full of what you need and goes down super smooth. When you give your body what it needs, you'll truly enjoy it for the long run. You can grab energy bars, chews, hydration mix, recovery drink mix, and super high carb drink mixes for your big days from scratch to fuel your training and upcoming adventures. I use the lemon lime super high carb mix every single day. I use a half serving within an hour of all morning runs, and it's my main fuel source for road long runs. For trail adventures, I use a couple servings in my bottles and supplement that with the chews or other fun trail snacks. You can use the code FTLR20 for 20% off your order at the link in the show notes. Thanks again to Scratch for supporting the show. I love what you said about the being on the same course, doing the same thing, just at different paces. Um, My circle here in Boulder and just in general has... A lot of people who have done some really exceptional things in the sport at at the highest levels, and I'm maybe a little faster than your average runner, but certainly like not even close to elite or professional. But I can run with these people, and they can understand my story and my my journey, and we can connect on that. And that's the component that I think that if you're running a two hour, ten minute marathon a three hour marathon, a seven hour marathon, whatever it might be, like you still have to do the work and both sides of that spectrum can appreciate how the other one is is doing it regardless of the pace. And to me, that's the uniqueness of the sport that it's a universal, like, so yeah, some people are gifted genetically, but like that's only good for a little bit if you don't actually put in the work. Um, right. And to me, that's that's the super cool part that like, anyone can't be good at running because to be good at running, you just have to run, right? It's, it's kind of that simple. Consistency right. is rewarded and and yeah. it leaves you with whatever you're looking for. And if you want to run a marathon, a 50 mile or whatever, mile as fast as you can, um, it's up to you. Right. And John, let me get you one more example, man. So like, this is one of the reasons why I do it. I was running Detroit Marathon. I think this is my second or third time running it. And I was running the marathon. And I was, I don't know if you ran Detroit, but Detroit has it where the half marathoners run on pretty much like the same course as the full marathoner. So like... Veer off. Veer off. But like you have like 
it's pretty much two half marathons happening on the same course. Yep. So you have Phil, like Phillies like this, yeah. Or it yeah, used to yeah, be. Yeah. So on the second half of the half marathon, I'm running the full. I'm around mile 18. I don't know what I can't do the math in my head to figure out what that is for whatever per, you know, what whatever distance the half marathon was running. But I come about this if lady. If you're at mile 18 and a half marathon, you've made a serious mistake. I mean, I'm on mile 18 of a marathon <laughs> and they are on like whatever got it, got whatever it, distance it. that is for a half marathon. Um and I come about this lady, right? So I'm already tired, but I see this lady, she got her shoes off and she's sitting on the side of the road. That for me is a bad sign. So, <laughs> so I reach, I go out to her. I'm like, "Hey, are you okay?" And then she turns around, and is like, "Oh my god, you are Martinez Evans! Like, can I get a hug? Can I take the selfie? Yada yada yada." And I'm like, "We can do all that, but like, are you okay? Like, you're on this, you're sitting on the curb with both of your shoes off." And her be like, "Man, I bought these damn shoes at the expo. I don't know what I was thinking." <laughs> I'm okay. My sister says she's going to bring me some shoes. Take a selfie. I continue on with the race. Finish the race, and I get my medal, and I remember talking to my wife, like, hey, like, there's this lady I seen. Like, I wonder if she finished. Like, she was sitting on the side of the curb. I seen her. Took a selfie, all this other stuff. And as soon as I said this to my wife, she's coming around the corner, coming to finish the race. Coming to find out, like, that's her first half marathon. So she's, like, crying, boo-hooing. And then I, I just happened to go to the volunteer and I was like, hey, can I give her her medal? So I give her her medal, like, yo, congratulations, you did this shit. Like, here's your medal. Now it's like waterworks all over the place. <laughs> thank you, thank you. This is amazing. I can't believe this. But she finished the rest of the race with no shoes on. Like, she just ran in her socks. And to be able to come to her, medal her, and say, like, you did it congratulations, like, you did that shit. And, like, what it meant to her, like, it's me, but, like, like what it meant to her is the feeling that I wanted to give to everybody and running in the back of the pack to let them know that their hard work is is to be rewarded. Like, you spending seven hours on a, a, on a marathon course should be celebrated. In regardless to what anybody else would say, you was on your feet for seven hours. Like that's somebody's whole work day and you was on your feet and you kept moving and that should be celebrated. And I think those are the things that really keeps me running and uh, keeps me to share my story with other people in order to help them get inspired to start running as well. So much so that you wrote a book. Yes. Talk to me about the book. Yes, Slow Yeah Run Club, the ultimate guide for anybody who wants to run. Um, this book here is the book I wish I would have had when I started running in 2012. Um, it's a how-to manual. And the reason I wrote this book is that most running how-to books are written by elite athletes or former elite athletes or coaches of elite athletes teaching you how to run like them, right? So I, I think about the the gold standard of like running books is like the Jack Daniels book on running. I don't know how it became the gold standard, but you read the forums and everybody's like, this, this is the running book you need to read. Cause his name is, uh, is synonymous with the, with the drink everyone likes, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's easy marketing. Drunk. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that, that is the gold standard yeah, yeah. for running books. Right. Um, but that book, if you actually read it, it's confusing as hell, man. Like V.02s, formulas, two quality runs, all this other stuff. But it doesn't help teach like the beginner runner or somebody who's intimidated about running, like some of the foundational stuff that we probably all learned the hard way. So for example, hey, there's this thing called body glider, squirrels nut butter that you probably put on your parts so they won't burn up. Or like, hey, Maybe you shouldn't run in cotton underwear <laughs> or like in, just in cotton in general, right? I, I knew you in 2013. Why didn't you tell me this? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like that type of stuff or like, hey, I know you thinking that, you know, y- you want to run to lose weight and you think that maybe you should like not eat, but go run first because that'd be good for you. I'm here to tell you that that's probably a bad idea, Right. Um, like those types of advice that I, I learned the hard way and I just bumped my head along the way to learn. 
I wrote this book to help minimize that journey for other people so that they can actually get to the real stuff about running that they can be worried about. Because imagine like, imagine being a beginner runner and you're running in cotton underwear and like now your underparts are all frayed up. Every time you get in the shower, it feels like you um, been sliced up by a, a thousand razor blades. Like that takes about two to three weeks off your off your running journey. Well, you're not supposed to run in cotton underwear. <laughs> Seriously, the, 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 the like things that nobody talks about related yeah. to starting running. Like I, so I started as a, as a 22 year old. And so many of the people I was running with have been running in high school or college. And like, maybe they learned those lessons back then or whatever. Mm-hmm. But like, it's an interesting point that I never thought about. Like the little intricacies of things that you, you don't like, you don't know what you don't know. And you don't right. know that you need to lube up your nuts because otherwise it's going to, you know, bleed in the it's shower. Gonna be very unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, um, we jokingly, so I watched the marathon from mile 24.2 and, uh, we, the number of people that have bloody nipples, it was out, outrageous. <laughs> But I've I've been there. I've finished a marathon with two red dots. <laughs> what are you gonna do? So that's in the book too. I'm assuming. Yeah, like loop them bad boys up, put some band aids on it, right? Um, so that that's my approach from the book. Like, if if you were to ask a close friend, like, "Hey, man, teach me everything you know about running." And it's going to be in funny stories. It's going to be in, you know, it's going to have actual legit points. And it's going to have parts of in the book for workbook section. So you can add your own stuff to figure out like what's best for you. That's literally the running book I wish I would have. All right. 2012, you're sitting with with, uh, Dr. Pepper, whoever this crazy doctor is. And somehow some vision pops into your head. And Martinez of 2023 is on a podcast or on Instagram talking about this book that he he launched. What are you thinking about seeing 10 plus years into the future, seeing how far you've come? Um, proud, man. Just some of the stuff that I've experienced throughout running, I would never even imagine that it was possible. The places that it took me, like, I wouldn't have believed it. Like, I wouldn't have believed the person be like, hey, like, you're going to run Big Sur. You're going to run on Route 1 where no no cars and you'll be able to see the whole, the whole Big Sur on feet. Or like, hey, you're going to go to Berlin. Like, you've never been there, but you're going to enjoy the food. You're going to drink random beer with random strangers. And like, you're going to run the race of your lifetime and like, and just be in the rain. Like those things that I would never have found or even thought about, but these things happen because of running. It's wild where it takes us if if we let it, right? I, I feel the same exactly. way. I, ne- I never ran growing up. Um, I played baseball and hockey, so running was always the punishment or the thing that like exactly. we never wanted to do. And if I could see myself now back then, I'd be like, nope, don't believe you. Different John. Um <laughs> Do you think about that kind of stuff? Like, do you, do you think about how far you've come and where you're going next and, and all that stuff? I, I find gratitude to be a incredibly yeah. powerful tool. All of the time, man. All of the time. Like, I'm even thinking about myself now of like preparing myself for Martinez, what it looks like from the next five to 10 years from now, right? I think this book, this run club is... Um, just a launching point to something bigger. And I don't know what that is, right? Like, who knows? Like, I might mess around and be an RD at like one of the world majors. I don't know. Like, I I, I can see it. I can believe it because I know how far I've came. But like, I I think those are the things that I'm preparing myself for now to really understand um, how am I going to um, continue to influence the running industry in the way that I would like it to do. And it reminds me of a quote I I recently heard, and they said, like, the best way to complain is to go make stuff. So 
that's that's what I'm doing, right? Instead of me complaining about how all these running books don't necessarily support people like me, I made it. You know, instead of being like, you know, these running clubs, they say they for everybody and all paces welcome, but I still get left. I made one. So who knows? Like, I don't know. I might make a race. Like, I, I just think about that. Like, the best way to complain is to make things. I love that. There's so much power in action and there's so much weakness in complaining without action. And the latter, you just feel sorry for yourself. The former is empowering and like can actually make some cool shit happen. Um, so you talked about fast forward five, 10 years. Um, this is now your full-time job, right? Yes. What's that like? <laughs> it's amazing and daunting at the same time is the best way to put it. Isn't it crazy? It, we can just like make careers out of talking to people. <laughs> yes. It's amazing. And don't like people, my friends and family don't know what I do. Like they just think I play on the internet. But it's amazing, man, to have all these thoughts, to be able to create new thought, to put stuff on some pe- pencil and paper, to inspire uh, a group of people that you necessarily know didn't know you was going to inspire, to be somewhat of a pseudo celebrity in this like this field is things that I would never would have thought of. But there are all those times where I'm like, all right, how am I going to pay rent this month? <laughs> <laughs> But then somehow you figure it out. <laughs> somehow I figure it out. What's it? What's it like going places and knowing that someone is doing something there because you've inspired them? Like the woman that finished the half marathon, and then you got to actually see her finish and see the joy in mm-hmm. her face. What's it like? Like I just I got an email earlier today um, from. I I host these monthly um, 5Ks as part of a relationship with Boulder Boulder 10K here here in Boulder. Um, And so we run, it's like a downhill 5K and there's, I don't know, 15, 25 people that show up each time. I got an email from a woman who's 69 years old and she's like, I'm dead fucking last every single time and I absolutely love it. And it's such Mm -hmm. motivation and like, I'm out there, I'm loving it and it's the kick in the pants I I need to, to keep it rolling. This kind of stuff makes me feel so good and it's like so cool that we can have an influence on people like this. Um, Do you ever stop and think about that? That like, and the reason I'm asking this is because sometimes I feel that social media is like, like, what the hell is the point of me posting my run every single day? Mm -hmm. This is so narcissistic. I can't believe I'm still doing this. Who cares? And then you get (laughs) messages like that. Do you, do you think about that kind of stuff too? Absolutely. On both sides of that coin? Absolutely. And like, that's one of the reasons why, like, it's one of the reasons why I wrote the book is because I want to I want to move from it's being about me like in my journey because I feel like, like I'm not an elder statesman but I like I ran the race like I ran marathons I'm going to continue to run marathons I know like you know if I don't finish it wasn't in the books but like that doesn't make me less than a runner but I think now to focus on more other people other than myself that's out on the course and providing them with the inspiration or like the thing they need in order to get to the finish line means a lot more than, or means a lot more to me than like a PR, you know, it just means a lot more. So, you know, those are the things that really excites me more about running is instead of being like a runner influencer, like I I, I tend to look at myself as like a influential person and running. And being able to have a voice for the people who are, are are in the back, but also have a voice for some of the things that I experience that really hasn't changed much, so that we can really like garner change inside the running industry. Do you feel any pressure? Um, I did. You know, I was signed to a couple, you know, brands where. They're like, oh, you got to run. You got to run all these races. And like, I felt pressure with that type of thing. But I'm like, I'm not necessarily an athlete, but like, why well, I got to run 
all of these races. And I, I kind of sort of felt pressure then, but now I really don't, man. Like the way that I, um, the way that I've restructured, like how I make money is not to necessarily worry about brand deals anymore. Like if they come, they come, but like, I really want to make a living just supporting running and supporting runners and give them running in the most accessible way. Um, and one of the ways that I'm doing that is by actually launching a, um, a nonprofit. So I'm launching the Slow F Run Club Foundation that's going to provide, you know, free running to individuals all over the world. What does that look like? Oh, man. Um, it looks like providing um, the the infrastructure for individuals to be able to launch their own local Slow F Run Club. Um, it also looks like, you know, providing various running plans for free. Um, it just also looks like giving people who not necessarily have the right gear in place, like the right gear or like, you know, in a perfect world, like what we're doing is giving people free gear, giving people free eight, uh, rent, uh, race entries and like giving them travel to run these races and participate in ways that they never thought they could. It opens up a huge opportunity to like really leverage it. I've thought a lot about um, how I use this platform and the partners that I can work with. And as you said earlier, the majority of runners are not running sub three marathons. They're not running sub four marathons. Um, in fact, the average is, is above four hours. And as you called out, it's getting slower at the same time, more and more people are running. And there are so many things that can be done both in and outside of running that enable running to happen. Um, so I'm thinking about like airlines and hotels and like, how do we partner with brands like that mm -hmm. where, People are using these services and, and products and whatnot outside of running, but it certainly does enable running to happen, thinking about scholarships, thinking about like ways to leverage these brands' desire to reach more people and to like in today's climate of mission matters and activism and like supporting the right things versus just getting awareness. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity there. I don't necessarily know what it is, but um, I'm I'm pursuing it because I think there is something there and, and they should all be interested in making it more accessible and whatnot. Um, I don't know. That's, yeah. a, that's a conversation for another day, maybe. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, this has been a blast. Um, I guess my last question would be, Outside of everything you wrote in the book, or maybe inclusive of everything you wrote in the book, what would you say to the version of yourself from 10 years ago? I would say that you matter. Um, all of the things that you thought was only, or like all of the issues you thought was just a you problem, isn't. Everybody else is experiencing these things. And most of the time they're experiencing it in silence. So continue to move forward and continue to use your voice to to get the word out. Because you wouldn't believe, John. Like, okay. you really wouldn't believe how many people are in the back of the pack and, like, the, the look of defeat that happens on their face when they see the volunteers slip over the water table. And you'd be like, so there's no more water on the course? <laughs> like, no. There's no more water on the course. It's like... Damn. I love asking that question because it's framed as what would you tell yourself? But the feedback I get is I needed to hear that too. And, mm -hmm. and as you said, everyone out there is out there dealing with something and, and this universality aspect of like where everyone thinks that everyone's thinking about the other people all the time, but everyone's just too busy thinking about all the things in it that are in their own head and all these right. like frustrations that are so um, consistent, no matter, you know, everyone's working through something. Right. And so I, I find it to be super helpful to hear words like that because it, you needed to hear it probably hundreds or thousands of people listening to this podcast also might need to hear it. 
Um, Martinez, thank you so much for taking the time to chat today. Thanks for doing what you do. And, uh, and we'll see you out there. Thank you, John. Where can we find your book, by the way? Uh, so you can find the Slow EF Run Club, the ultimate guide for anybody who wants to run, wherever books are sold. Um, so Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Um, we're also doing this thing. Um, I'm partnered with um, Pocket Books. So pocketbookshop.com. Uh, that will be the only place if you're looking to get an autographed book. Um, if you pre-order it before, I can remember, let's just say June 1st, um, your book will come autographed by yours truly. There we go. Love it. All right, we'll see you out there. Thank you. That's it for today's episode. Like many long runs, it's sad when it has to end. I hope you join in next time on For the Long Run. And in the meantime, happy trails. If you enjoyed this episode, it would mean a lot to me if you shared it so that others can find it and enjoy it too. This podcast and the accompanying music has been produced by Brian Walters of Single Track Sound. For the Long Run's logo was created by Vanessa Wolf of Sterling Wolf. Show notes have been written by Ruby Wiles and is managed by Emily Holland. It takes a village. 